Tell me, was Venus more beautiful than you are? When she topped the crinkled waves, drifting shoreward on her plated shell? Was Bordicelli's version fairer than mine? And were the painted rosebuds he tossed his lady of better worth than the words I blow about you to cover your too great loveliness, as with a gauze of misted silver? Look why shine those floating bubbles with such light divine. They break, and from their mist a lily form rises from out the wave in beauty warm. For me, you stand poised in the blue and buoyant air, cinctured by bright winds, treading the sunlight and the waves which precede you, ripple and stir the sands at my feet. The wave is by the blue-veined feet scarce pressed. Her silky ringlets float about her breast, veiling its fairy loveliness while her eye is soft and deep as the heaven is high. The beautiful is born, sea and earth may well revere the hour of that mysterious birth. Section 1 uh... Today, I want to talk to you about modernist poetry. Okay, now that there's only four of us left, <laughs> let's begin again. Today, I would like to talk to you about modernist poetry, an interesting connection between romanticism and modernism, and what that connection could mean for literary analysis going forward. We're going to be discussing the sublime today and getting pretty in-depth with what that really means. Most of you will probably remember back to 12th grade lit, sitting in your class as your teacher begins to prep you to read some romance or gothic novel. My class read Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. But since that was a school copy and I do not own my own, Pride and Prejudice will be my prop stand in for today. Fun fact, I got this copy out of a trash can at school at the end of junior year because someone just pulled everything out of their locker and sat it on top of the trash can. Some may say that's where this book should have stayed, but they are actually wrong. Anyways, back to 12th grade lit. My teacher had a Scottish accent, so imagine that while I describe this to you. The sublime is an overwhelming force that resides in the connection between a person and the forces of the natural world. Imagine you're at the beach on a beautiful summer day. You hear the waves crash against the shore, smell the salt in the air, Walk slowly out into the water. Feel the sand between your toes. Walk out further and further still till you can just keep your head above water with your toes barely touching the sand below. Look back towards the shore, how painfully close you remain to where you started. Look ahead of you again and think, how much more is there between me and the next shoreline? Allow a deeper understanding of the vastness of the earth and her oceans to wash over you. That is the sublime. According to Immanuel Kant, the sublime is many things. The sublime can be terrifying, it can be noble, it can be magnificent. There are a few things that it must always be. It must always be large, and it must always be simple. It is an overwhelming feeling that is connected with the vast power of seemingly mundane natural forces that surround us every day. I am, of course, simplifying this because I just said in a few lines what Kant said in 200 pages. I'm also taking out some of the more icky parts of Kant's philosophy. Unfortunately, this sends sentence either Kant or Burke, and both are icky. Kant just happened to be easier to read. But that is a very romantic understanding of the sublime. Section 2. Romanticism. Romanticism is the literary style that occupied much of the 17th century, featuring well-known authors such as Mary Shelley, Oscar Wilde, William Wordsworth, the Bronte sisters, and many, many others. Romanticism focused less on the strictly scientific aspects of life that had become popular during the Enlightenment and more on the naturalistic and deeply personal aspects of its characters. It also had a large focus on the sublime. That immense feeling of being so incredibly small, the feeling that the force of the water may start to consume you, is the best that I am able to approximate to the romantic understanding of the sublime. I picked the ocean because it is something that most people have experienced before, and even if you haven't, you can still get a pretty clear picture in your mind. That raw energy is what writers like Percy Shelley were trying to conjure in their writing. This poem is called The Birth of Aphrodite and is describing, well, 
You see, it's describing, get this, the birth of Aphrodite. For those of you who are deprived from reading Rick Riordan's magnum opus, The Titan's Curse, or the book series that surrounded it, Aphrodite is a member of the Hellenistic pantheon of gods. For the purpose of our discussion today, we are going to focus on the most common idea of Aphrodite, where she is the goddess of love, beauty, and sexuality. We can return to Aphrodite as a war goddess... not today. Aphrodite was born from the sea. In fact, she was born from the dissected generals of Oranos, the old titan of the sky, who was the father of Kronos and his brood of titans. After overthrowing their father, the titans chopped into bits and threw his body across the known world. Following the great war between the Olympians and the titans, Aphrodite rose from the sea in some beautiful fashion that may have looked like this in the spot where Uranus's genitals landed in the sea. Yes. Given that Percy Shelley lived in the 17th and 18th century of the Common Era and not the 17th and 18th centuries before the Common Era, it is safe to assume that he wrote Birth of Aphrodite based off of this painting, even though he got the name wrong. Shelley uses a unique style of romanticism to bring a small portion of Aphrodite's divine beauty into perspective by using the power of the ocean to bring everything into perspective. Think back to your short walk into the vast ocean. That overwhelming power is, according to Shelley, a small portion of Aphrodite's beauty. That is the power that romantic poetry can hold, describing the divine through not just a basic understanding of who Aphrodite is, but to also use the power of natural things that we can all experience. That is how romanticism seeks to define the sublime. Beauty, power, nobility, terror, explored not through some scientific explanation, but through the deeply personal relationship we all have with the natural world. Section 3. Modernism. Modernism was the defining literary movement of the start of the 20th century. Standout authors of the time would be those like Fitzgerald, Orwell, Lowell, and others. It stands in many ways in opposition with the more traditional writing styles, such as Romanticism. Modernism is less a specific movement and more a series of smaller movements that operated under one umbrella term. Philosophically, this is when many of the grand theories started to emerge. Theories that sought to unite the whole of human history under one grand idea, or as I like to call them, big thoughts. Um, but they would later be called meta-narratives by nerds like Jean-Francois Léotard. Léotard was a philosopher and a literary theorist who worked closely with Jacques Derrida and other influential post-structuralists. <laughs> Once again, a discussion for not today. But Léotard did talk about something that is very important to our discussion today. He argued that the sublime in modernism was a move away from the beautiful and a liberation of the constraints of the human condition. His post-structuralism really showing through there. I disagree slightly, and maybe it's because I personally am not a fan of post-structuralism, but I find that this idea would not have really held water in a conversation with modernist thinkers. He is applying a post-structuralist framework onto modernism, which would see post-structuralism as a completely alien concept. I think we should really look at some of those big thoughts of modernism to find somewhere they were pulling from. And a really popular framework in modernist philosophies was the dialectic. For those who haven't seen my video on the differences between teacher and student-based education, a dialectic is a pretty simple philosophical concept that can be applied in a multitude of ways. Very simplistically, a dialectic is a framework where you take a thesis and an antithesis, and after investigating and interrogating the two, you find a synthesis. This idea was first used by Zeno of Elie, uh, but was quickly stolen by the absolute philosophical chad that is Socrates. It was then perfected by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, or just Hegel if you want a nerd. Well, actually, if you're talking about Hegel, you are a nerd, so I guess it's just if you aren't as much of a nerd. Then it was picked up by a few modernist philosophers. But how is modernist literature using the dialectic to find the sublime? It's now time to return to the other poem that started this video, Amy Lowell's Venus Transients. The first thing that I'm going to say is that Amy Lowell is a lesbian, 
but if you are a member of the LGBTQ plus community, you probably already knew that. This poem is very clearly written about a woman, and lesbians going back to Sappho just have a certain way that they write about their partners that men just have not been able to replicate. Step it up, man. How does Lowell find the sublime in this poem? Well, she is describing a beach trip with longtime lover Ada Dwyer Russell. She describes in such a deeply intimate fashion every aspect of her beloved, likening her to Botticelli's Birth of Venus. It's almost a bit too personal, like it was meant to be sent purely from Lowell to Russell and no one outside of the couple. She's taking something so incredibly mundane, which is to say simply not divine instead of boring, and comparing it to the utmost divine, both artistically and religiously. The modernists really liked leaning into the Greek pantheons for whenever they needed a divine force similarly to the Romantics. So that is the dialectical basis of modernist literature. Take something that is utterly mundane of this world and compare it to or bring it to the level of that which is divine. And it's not just Lowell. Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby does the same thing. Nick and Jay are both utterly mundane figures at the very beginning of their stories but they are pulled into the world of the rich and famous of New York. But you also see that there is still a separation, curiously enough, represented by the green light. That tension between the mundane and the divine that is just constantly holding you right on the edge is what drives the internal conflicts of the story. Also, Nick was gay for Gatsby, and I have the proof. But that's for another day. Section 4. Synthesis. So. What does this mean for us as readers of great literature moving forward? Well, it means a few things. Moving forward, as we continue to read more and more literature, this is a theory that you can read a story with. This isn't me saying that you have to read every modernist text trying to find the sublime. I hate to say this to the modernists, but no theory can apply to every text. Sorry to invalidate your big thoughts. But like queer theory, feminist theory, materials theory, or any other literary theory, it is another tool to add to your toolbox. We can also push this forward from modernism to postmodernism. Postmodernism is essentially just the dismantling and abandoning of those big thoughts. Maybe, and I hate to say this, the post-structuralists like Leotard are correct, but at just about the wrong time period. Maybe I can crack into some Vonnegut at some point and test Leotard's hypothesis. I guess that'll also be when I talk about post-structuralism. I'll steal myself for the day. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, this was the final project for my English 2008 uh, course. It was um, American Literature of the 20th Century. Um, I had a lot of fun working on this. I had a lot of fun with this course. It, um, it's really something, this theory is something that I've really been working on basically since like week three um, when we first covered modernist uh, poetry and I got to reread Amy Lowell's uh, Venus Transients and it kind of just like, with the more analytical eye, it kind of just hit me. Um, so thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.